Hey, Chris, I think you just came in as me, if you can hear me, Chris. Uh, Haley, I made you a co-host, so glad you're here this morning. Hi. Hi. So I think as soon as Chris comes back, we're learning how to do this all together. So there's Chris. Chris. Is it going to be a co-host? Yes. Let's go to this. More. Um, so, Haley, what we'll do is we'll start off basically kind of like the script I sent you. We'll start off, we'll do introductions of me and of you, and then uh, we'll show your video. Did you not get a script from me? I don't think so. Well, it's just fine. We're going to do some 
introductions and then we'll show the video and then the floor is yours. Anything that you want to say, I'll ask you some questions off the video. Some folks will, uh, some folks will uh, probably have some questions in the chat feature and then I've got stuff to finish out the hour. So um, you probably have one screen right now, right? Just one. Yep. Mm -hmm. I I'm going to email it to you anyway, just that way you have it. Uh, uh, you don't have to refer to it though. It's no big deal. All right, so let's go to email and let's go to uh, Haley Jackson and the script. And let's go to here. Very script. Attach a copy. And it's on its way. All right. Well, Chris, I had a poll. I even made it and several people took it, but when you logged in as me, it took it off. So um, we'll have to work on that for next time. See what happens then. You should be able to just start doing it again. Yeah, I keep saying it's inactive because you're logged in from another device. Maybe if I click out of it and try it this way. Yeah, I, that's what I logged out as my, I logged out because I noticed that instantly, you know. Yep, so <laughs> more, I don't know, do more. Oh, well, it was no big deal anyway. But I did try, Chris, I tried. We respect the effort. <laughs> well, Zach from Pork's on, Haley, so the pressure's on. I got another intern on here with you, so. <laughs> I believe in you, Haley. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. <laughs> But we'll get started just a couple minutes after nine. Hey, Chris, I'm going to step away. I forgot to put the signs up. Tell them not to walk in. Guys, I relaunched the poll, but unfortunately it had to clear the results if you took it before. So if you did take it before, if you want to do it again, uh, we can get everybody's results on there.
Yeah, Chris, I can't see the poll, uh, but apparently people can, so. Yeah, so far 18 of 25 have taken it. And so, yeah, just let me know when you're ready and I, I can end it and share the results for everybody. There you go. Hi folks, if you're here, there should be a poll for you just to get a little background for you to see who we're working with. And uh, also it's a new feature we're playing with, so we're trying. Um, if you take that, we'll, we'll wait just a couple minutes as more people get admitted and we'll start our virtual field trip with Haley Jackson, our 2020 Midwest Dairy Association intern. So give us a couple minutes. We are recording this and it will be at our at our slot beyond the barn door at wordpress.com. So you can look for it there. Now, Haley, I also see Mackenzie from the Beef Association has joined, and she actually has some phenomenal beef photos in the background. So she is a step up, but Mackenzie, is that the office or is that home? Yeah, I'm at the office. Oh, okay. So <laughs> <laughs> no office for Haley, so no, no points deducted for that with uh, your favorite uh, dairy cows in the background. Well, folks, it's 9.02. As some people are still joining, we're going to go ahead and respect our time and get going. My name's Kevin Darty, and I'm with Ag in the Classroom, based out of Bloomington in the state office uh, with the Illinois Farm Bureau. Today with me are uh, Haley Jackson. And Haley, go ahead and give a wave so people can see you in the screen. Uh, Haley Jackson is the Midwest Dairy 2020 Association intern. So she's with the Midwest Dairy Association. And uh, for our virtual field trips, as a way to try and uh, uh, incorporate the Summer Ag experience, the Summer Ag Institute experience, we knew that we needed to have field trips. And how could we take y'all on field trips? Well, the interns got together and volunteered. Well, actually they were voluntold. Uh, so some of you have been in that situation. The, mid, the, the interns were voluntold that they were going to lead in it, uh, a field trip for us. Um, so Haley, um, she got voluntold even stronger because we knew we were kicking things off with dairy and dairy lessons. Uh, so we're really grateful for what Haley was able to do, how she did this. And uh, Haley, I'll have you introduce yourself first to the group. Hi everyone, I'm Haley Jackson and I'm originally from Frankfort, Indiana. I go to school at Iowa State University where I'm studying dairy science and I'm the 2020 Midwest Dairy Illinois intern this summer. So typically Haley's uh, internship, uh, uncoveted, would really be uh, doing teacher training and helping with uh, uh, dairy promotions. June would have been really busy for her and then she would be really really busy gearing up for the state fair as well. Currently the state fair is on. Uh, we don't know when, uh, we're pretty sure that I'm pretty sure that it's probably gonna be canceled. Other state fairs around us have been canceled. So Haley has taken the opportunity to help us by going on a dairy farm. And this came with unique challenges. 
as she mentioned to you, I talked to her the first time and I knew that she was from Indiana, but she was actually in Iowa. So she, in one weekend, she moved from, Indi from Iowa back home to Indiana, shot a video and then came to Illinois where she's interning. So uh, that, that was kind of a whirlwind weekend a couple weeks ago. And here she is now based out of, you're based out of Springfield, correct, Haley? Yep. Yeah. So with that, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, Haley did share uh, a video. So she's uh, got a video for us from uh, a farm in her area, and uh, we're going to share that. So if you'll sit back and relax, uh, maybe you got some of that bubba bub, bubba bug popcorn, and uh, we will uh, we will share our video with you. So let's go here. And I'm gonna go here and I need to share the video and I'm going to make it full screen and I'm going to, um, that's a new share. And under more, I'm going to share computer sound. Look at this, we're all good now. So if you'll sit back and watch Haley's uh, video of the Midwest Dairy Association field trip to a dairy farm. Um, I will say if you have questions, you can write those in the chat feature. We'll address those at the end. But enjoy Haley's video from a field trip to a dairy farm. Hi, everyone. My name is Haley Jackson, and I'm a 2020 Midwest Dairy Illinois intern. Um, I'm, also, I'm also a student at Iowa State University, and I am studying dairy science. One of the things that I've been challenged to do is to create a video showing my farm and my animals and what I kind of what goes into raising dairy. So one of the things we have out here is we have a pasture and our heifers during the summer and spring and a little bit in the fall months, um, they come out here and they're able to graze um, pretty much all day long. They even enjoy laying out here in the grass, which it's a beautiful day out for them to do it right now. Um, in the winter months, we actually keep them inside and keep them on a round bale of hay, which we make ourselves. And um, that way they're able to get nutrients. Another thing we do is we also um, have this um, kind of a ration that we feed and it has grain um, with other different things in it. And then we also feed a top dress of these pellets and these are high in protein. So between this and the hay, they are able to get all of the nutrients that they need. And we've worked closely with the nutritionist and our feed salesman to get kind of the diet that our animals need. And when they're um, older, they will go to a different farm to get milk as we don't have the facilities to do it here. Um, at that farm, they will get a ration called a TMR. And what that stands for is a total mixed ration. And it has everything, um, all the nutrients, minerals, everything that a cow needs besides water, I guess, that the cow needs to survive and produce a high quality product. Um, so the farm that we're going to look at later, which is where my animals go, have what is called a partial mix ration in that they're on a pasture part of the time and are also being fed grain in the parlor. So they do get their nutrients. Um, they do get a, the total amount of nutrients that they need. It's just in a little bit of a different form. The farms that you guys are seeing today is pasture based and there are many different kinds of farms. Um, your more larger dairies are going to be freestyle based. Um, whereas more of your smaller family farms are the pasture base. Um, so one of the things that you can tell that a cow is happy and healthy is that she's chewing her cud. And so what that looks like is they're just chewing their mouths. It looks like they're chewing a piece of gum, honestly. Um, but what they're doing is they're bringing up um, food from their stomach and kind of rechewing it and getting it to digest a little bit better. Another thing that we do is we keep uh, close contact with our veterinarian if we see any problems going on with our heifers or our cows at the farm. Um, and we keep in close contact with them, making sure that we stay on top of any illness that could arise. Um, so my heifers here are have been raised, except for we actually bought two of them. But um, this heifer right here has actually been raised here as a young calf. And she'll be kept here until she's about two years old and she's ready to have her first calf. And what that, that's called is she's called freshening. So she has the first calf and she has, um, the first milk that she has is actually full of colostrum or, and it's full of nutrients that the calf needs to be able to survive and fight off any viruses or bacteria that could arise from the environment. So um, this heifer here is about a year and a half, about, about 
about a year old actually. And then our two red heifers in the back are both, were both born last fall. And then our black, more black heifer, black bear, is actually going to be turning two in December. So we have a very range of ages out here in this pasture, but, um, and we'll show them all around the state and even at some national shows. So she's actually, our black and white heifer back there is actually bred and we'll hopefully be calving in here in the next nine months, which is actually the gestation or length of time that it takes from uh, the calf to be born. Today I'm here with Casey Baker at his family's dairy farm. And we're just gonna talk about um, the cows and a little bit more about what he does on a daily basis. So can you give us a background on kind of your farm? So we are, I would be a fourth generation dairy farmer. ship all our milk through DFA, um, pasture-based farm, I do feed grain, and silage also. So when you were talking about the silage, the silage is actually fed out here in the pasture, correct? Correct. And then where do you guys feed the grain at? The grain is fed in the parlor while we milk. And how many times a day do you guys milk? Twice a day. Alright. Um, what kind of information can you tell us about these cows? Are they, um, what kind of age are they? And where they at, maybe talk a little bit about their lactation. So we've got cows ranging from clear to the oldest cow out here is 14 years old. And then we have just cows that are just fresh to be two year old cows. Um, we've got cows in their lactation that are probably from 15 days fresh to 250 days fresh at the moment. Okay. Um, do you have any more comments out while we're out here in the pasture kind of? Looking around, how many cows do you guys milk in this? Uh, 45 at the moment. Um, mainly milk in all jerseys, but two whole things. Um, you want to Yep. 
so we're out here with the baby calves. Um, these are Jersey calves, and Macy's gonna tell us a little bit about how they uh, feed them and kind of the age of animals that they keep mm. on milk. Okay, so we go up to three months on milk, maxed out after that. You're muted. Yep, there we go. So thank you. Um, so thank you, Haley. Uh, one of the first questions was, uh, uh, sometimes it's hard to hear. And I will tell you, I ask our interns specifically to give a tour. And uh, anybody that's ever been on a Summer Ag Institute, I receive all sorts of the uh, evaluations. And anytime that we go to a farm, people love it, but it's always hard to hear. So with that, we have recorded it and you can go back and listen to it again. But I do have a great question for you. The, uh, the freestyle based pasture. Uh, this is a great question, Haley. Uh, specifically the, the uh, part where they were talking about cows being on pasture versus uh, uh, free stall. So the free stall versus pasture-based. Can you explain that a little bit, Haley? So a pasture-based farm is where um, cows and heifers are able to graze um, for most of the year, not all of the year, and then they're kept in a barn um, during we bad weather conditions like the winter or storming outside. They're able to have access to a barn where they can go in and 
keep dry and warm. But a free stall based farm is a barn that cows can go and lay in specific stalls. It's a lot bigger and most of the time they don't have the ability to go out and graze and this is why it's typically on your bigger farms. Um, some smaller farms do have this and then they just turn cows out during the day on pasture and then bring them in during the night. Um, but larger farms have many cows and they don't have the pasture resources for that so they feed them all in the barn and have um, free stalls where they can go lay during the day. So that's a really great question and uh, for from a teacher perspective uh, it's different. If you've been in your classroom and then all of a sudden you go to a different school, a larger school, a smaller school, uh, some of you who've been around uh, long enough to be, be in schools that were based out of the 70s with that whole open concept, it's just a different way of doing it. Some farmers prefer one way over the other and it's just a different management technique. Um, a couple of great vocabulary words, uh, heifers and cows and Haley, you wanna explain that as a, as a, as a, a university student? Yeah, so a heifer is a female um, dairy or female animal that has not been um, bred or and has not have a had a calf yet. So calves are typically seven months old before they're really considered heifers in my opinion. And then they are called heifers for about a year and then they usually become bred and then have a calf or freshen is when they do have a calf and then they're considered to be cows. So basically mature animals are called cows. There you go. So that that the big thing is not all bovine are cows. It depends on if they'd had if they got to be female and they had to have had a calf first. Um, at the farm we visited, they talked about Jersey cows. They were Jersey cows. They were the light tan brown color. Um, those typically have a higher butter fat, the more more butter fat in their milk. It's just a different, it's a different breed. What were the, what were your cows? What kind of cattle do you raise? What breed do you specialize in? The ones on your farm? Mostly I have Holsteins. So there are actually two different kinds of Holsteins. There's black and white, um, which is the heifer that was eating my hair at one point. <laughs> and then there are red and whites. And red and whites are known as a small, not a smaller size and breed, but just the population size is a little a lot smaller. And uh, again, when we're talking breeds, there are a number of breeds uh, specifically that are raised for dairy that produce a lot of dairy. And uh, what's the difference? Well, some of you are some of you are uh, uh, poodle people, and some of you are Labrador people. So you know, there, there's all sorts of different breeds. It's just a different breed for what 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 you're what you're looking for. Um, uh, a question that I had. Um, the milk is stored on their farm every um, every day, and uh, the milk cup milk truck comes every other day. Who who processes their milk in in your part of Frankfort, Indiana? There, um, DFA or Dairy Farmers of America processes that milk. Okay, and uh, for those people who don't know, where is Frankfort? Give me a location, kind of across from Illinois. It is straight east of Purdue University or Lafayette, Indiana. So you are you are in the middle part of the state. So middle part of the state, like I seventy four Champaign. So you're in that that part of the uh, that part of the state there. Um, how many dairies in the area where you're from, Haley? There is actually only one dairy farm that's milking in my county. Um, the more more dairies are located in northern Indiana, up in like the Elkhart area. Um, the farm that uh, had the jerseys that I went to is actually from Fort Wayne, Indiana, um, but they also milk a few of our, uh, once our cows, once our heifers become cows, they become, um, there they go there to get milk, sorry. They go there to get milk. So your family chose not to milk and you're just raising the cattle. What, what other background do you have on, on the farm? Uh, there's probably other things going on on your farm besides uh, raising dairy cattle until they're ready to, uh, to, until they're ready to be freshened and to have a calf. So on my farm specifically, we raise pigs. Um, my dad works for a company that raises pigs and we live on the farm. There's also a little bit of corn and we do quite a bit of hay um, to feed for heifers and other farms. Well, and uh, uh, a question that, that I have, uh, uh, 
any of your processors, have they seen, it? we talked about the supply chain last week, any of your, or two weeks ago, any of your processors uh, seen uh, problems because of the supply chain? Um, not specifically in my area, it's happening more of in Wisconsin, a little bit in Iowa and Minnesota, just because that's where more of the dairy farms are located. Um, so they're having more issues with that, but it has studied out quite a bit. Right, and in Illinois, just for those of you in the audience, in Illinois, Illinois is a milk deficit state. We have to import our milk. We, we rank 21st in the, in the nation of milk production. Kind of an interesting fact, we're the 21st state and we rank 21st in milk production. So if we didn't import, if we built a wall around Illinois uh, and we didn't import milk, uh, from other states, we don't have we don't have enough milk here in Illinois to feed everybody with all the milks that they want and all the cheese and ice cream and yogurts as well. Uh, got a question for you, Haley. Your favorite part of raising dairy cattle? Uh, how about <laughs> for specifically dairy cows versus pigs? Um, I've never been that big of a fan of pigs, just because uh, I don't know. My dad always talks about it, and it's a lot more not labor intensive, but a lot more animals involved in pig farming compared to what I do. But I love seeing an animal go from being a calf to um, a large animal and like knowing I had a part in raising it and keeping it healthy throughout and making sure it's going to live long production, productful life. Well, and I think that's important too. Zach did chime in, said that pigs are cute and adorable. Zach is our pork uh, intern, so he's uh, gonna fight you on that. But uh, uh, the, uh, the length of time on the farm we visited, one of the cows is uh, 14 years old. What is the average uh, life expectancy of a, of, a, of a dairy cow? How long can they, how long can they produce and uh, uh, be a part of the dairy chain? So that cow actually had a longer life than, I would say not necessarily most, but compared to your conventional farms, um, just because of concrete, perfect, they're walking on concrete, they just, are getting pushed a little bit harder for milk production, but they're still really well taken care of. That cow has actually decreased a lot in her production over the years, so she's producing less. But the average lifespan of a good, healthy, um, strong producing cow is probably about six to seven years. Six to seven years, so that's uh, definitely on the other side. And uh, as mammals, uh, that's what they are, and they produce milk, there is, a, there is a tendency, there is a life expectancy of when that cow is producing milk. Again, as a mammal, uh, they can't produce milk until they've had a calf. And after a while, that calf, that milk, the estrogen, that kind of stuff, it, it decreases. And in order to produce more milk, the cow has to be freshened up again, have a calf. Um, I like the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the lady you were visiting that she talked about uh, the extra care that she gives in those Jersey cows. Um, now, I, I, will, I will take exception because, you know, she, her, she was talking about, the, I believe it was her husband that does the vet care and he does the nutrition. Um, what, would be, what would you consider some of those extra TLC things that she does uh, that, that beyond basic health care, beyond basic uh, nutrition and, and medicine aspects? So that would be things like making sure they are in a cool, clean environment. So making sure they have fresh straw to lay under or fresh sawdust, depending. So calves were laying on sawdust and then the cows were on straw. So making sure that's clean, making sure um, there's plenty of hay out for them. And then for calves, she does a little bit more of the calf care. Um, if they need a veterinarian, they do call it in. But um, for many farmers, they have the ability to treat their animals themselves. So she does a lot of that as well. Well, and I think that, uh, I think that goes right back to for our teachers in the audience. Uh, um, <laughs> you don't take your child to prompt care every time they fall. Um, now, um, my wife and I, we have three kids and we did with our first one, but by the third one, you know, there was a lot of suck it up buttercup and, uh, you know, we learned to put a bandaid on and when, when things were there. I think that's what you see with farmers. Uh, the day that you filmed it <laughs> was back during our first heat wave and they were talking about the amount of water those calves were uh, those cows were getting a lot a lot of water um, the importance of water to your animals Haley can you talk a little bit about that yeah so just like any of us we have to have water to survive um, cows and heifers have to have water to survive they get they get dehydrated just like humans and it's kind of hard to get them 
back to being healthy after they do become dehydrated. So making sure they have enough water. I think cows that have an average of drinking up to like two bathtubs full of water per day. So they do drink quite a bit of water. Right, and uh, that, is a, that is a really good point about uh, where, where we do see calf operations, where we do see cow operations. You do have to have a plentiful supply of water. Um, so that, that, that's really interesting. And the other part is uh, there, uh, that the, we go along with this, when they do bring a vet in, if there's something that goes wrong with an animal, uh, we do bring a vet in, um, the vet is able to provide medicine for it. But why don't you talk a little bit about uh, uh, animals that are on medicine, uh, specifically in the food chain. What happens to that animal if it's on medicine and it's, and it's being milked? So specifically for cows that are milking, the, if they are given something like an antibiotic, um, that milk is pulled out of the system so it doesn't even go in with the other milk and it is actually dumped and not used for human consumption. And then if an animal like a bull calf or a steer becomes sick, then that, does, that animal does not go through processing until it reaches a withdrawal time or the length of time it takes for the antibiotic to clear the animal system. And I think that in this uh, time of, um, <laughs> of all the news we're getting about, all the testing that's going on, this is not something new to farmers. Uh, they've been doing this for a long time. Uh, they need to take care of their animals and occasionally animals get sick. Uh, no matter how well you take care of your kids, sometimes they get sick and you go to the doctor and you provide them antibiotics and uh, you keep them home for, from school for two or three days till the fever passes. That's what you do with the animals as well. And again, if they're on medicine, if a, if a, if a cow, a milking cow was on medicine, they pull them out, um, uh, they, they uh, pull them out of the system, they still have to be milked. They still have to be milked, and, uh, uh, but that milk is separated. Um, I think that also goes to the technology aspect. Uh, they were talking about this cow eats this much, they know what the rations are, they're able to track that. Um, Haley, how are they doing that on the farms that you see? How are farmers using that tracking technology? So one thing that they're doing is they're testing for antibiotics at different levels. levels. So the milk is tested when, it, when they go pick it up from the farm. And then from there, when the truck leaves the farm, it gets tested before it gets put in with all the other trucks. So it's tested at least twice. Usually it's actually tested three times, once again, before it um, gets processed. And uh, that's really important because when that milk truck comes, they test it there as well. And if something were to happen, uh, the, it's dumped. The farmer loses that. So they want to make sure that they don't get, uh, they don't lose that, 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 that milk is money. So they want to make sure that they don't lose that as well. Um, you also talked a little bit about showing um, and I, uh, the, the difference between showing a dairy cow and showing a beef cow. Now, do you, is that something you participated in at both the uh, high school 4-H FFA and also at the college level? Is that something you're doing now, showing? Yes, so I was involved in 4-H and FFA when I was younger, so I had the ability to go to county, district, state, and national shows. And um, as a junior in the Holstein industry, I'm, I've actually aged out now, but last fall I was considered a junior because I was under 21. I was still able to show during college. So, and uh, the, uh, we talked a little bit about this on our last field trip about the idea of judging. Um, there is a certain standard that most people aspire toward, but just like uh, teachers um, and, and parents, uh, some those of you who've had teachers, sometimes everybody's rubric is slightly different. So uh, someone who might judge out as the grand champion, they got a great cow, everything is wonderful, and the next show they might come in and finish second or finish third. There is a little bit of subjectivity to it, but there is a rubric involved, uh, and everybody's rubric is just slightly, slightly different. So, uh, uh, plus there's also an as aspect of showmanship. So, Haley, why don't you talk a little bit about what you have to do in order to get a cow ready to show? So, to get ready for show, a big thing is cleanliness. So, making sure the animal has no manure on them and is um, all clipped up, so all of the hair except for the top part of the back or the spine is taken off and um, making and 
before you even get to the show, you have to go through a process of working with the animal, making sure they're comfortable with you, making sure you're comfortable with them. Some animals are just naturally kind of spooky and aren't very calm, so you have to work with them to make them um, more calm and um, able to be worked with. And uh, uh, for from a teacher perspective, I'll just I'll just give you that. Do you want to be evaluated the second or third day of class, or do you want to wait until your students know what's going on and you know what's going on for your for somebody else to come in and see how you're handling how things are going? So there, you do spend a lot of time with your animal, uh, getting them used to extra bass, getting them used to performing and walking around in certain ways and that type of thing. So uh, very very interesting on that. Um, you brought up a good point, and uh, our book that we'll be giving away, we'll be giving away three copies of uh, Tales of a Dairy Godmother, uh, Chuck's Ice Cream Wish by Viola Butler, so make sure you fill out the evaluation, the reflection form that Chris has sent out. Um, but uh, you talked a little bit about manure, and uh, that happens. It happens a lot on a farm. Uh, your, your, your cows are pasture-based, Haley, so uh, the what happens to that manure in the pasture? So when they, um, the manure in the pasture is actually just left there and it becomes basically like a fertilizer. So after it um, degrades, it becomes more like nutrients for the soil. And then the soil replenishes the grass and um, improves the grazing quality for the next year. Right, so now there's a difference between manure and a pasture, and that becomes fertilizer. Those of you who have uh, uh, dogs or cats, and you know if uh, those first spring days when you go out and you look at the yard and all of a sudden there are little patches of grass that are growing a little bit greener and a little bit taller, that happens in a pasture as well. But for those people in a barn, they have to manage their manure. And Haley, I'm, I'm gonna put you on the spot here. If you don't know, that's fine. But uh, uh, manure management, is a huge part of, uh, of working with animals. Uh, do you know, what do you know about that manure management? So part of the manure management is separating the solids from the liquid. The liquid is actually um, stored in a pit and then it is put, pumped back onto cropland and used as a fertilizer. So they work with an agronomist to kind of measure um, nutrient intake into the soil from the, from the manure and decide what kind of fertilizer they need to put on if they need to put on additional stuff. And the solids in some cases are actually able to be reused and composted to use as bedding in the future. And that's, that's, that's one part of it. Now for our teachers out there, oh lord, where are we going to go with this? And uh, here's the deal, if Captain Underwear is still one of the, Captain Underpants is still one of the best sellers, uh, manure and manure management can be as well. Uh, on our link, I want to show you uh, uh, one of my favorite aspects. And uh, uh, one of my favorite things is, uh, let's go here. I'm going to be sharing a, a video, and it's on YouTube. And I'm going to X this. I do why I've got the Baltimore City Schools, but I do. Uh, so we're going to get out of this, and we're going to go to get out of this, and we're going to go to another YouTube video and um, under my YouTube video I'm still sharing computer sound uh, this is by a, a dairy farmer in Alabama and his name is Will Gilmer and this has been around for a couple of years but Will Gilmer uh, he was a part of a, a part of a group called the US FRA US Farmers and Ranchers Alliance and uh, he uh, he made some videos about what he does, and this is a great, uh, I'll only show part of this, but it is on the link on our blog, our website. It's a song about nutrient management. So uh, let's go to full screen. Water and poo, water and poo, I'm going to tell you how we manage our water and poo. In an eco-friendly way, yes, that's how we like to play. What they drop when they're inside so we've got traps to collect their urine and their crap and that's our first step towards managing water and food it dum 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 now spreading slurry it ain't a daily chore we've got a big tank in which we keep it stored until we can fly it on our land in accordance with a nutrient management plan which said today 
day was perfect for spreading water and food. Unmute, we'll stop there. I can't tell you how much I like watching Will Gilmer uh, uh, talking about water and poo. Um, there is a nutrient management plan, and this is part of it. What happens to that? Uh, and for all animal agriculture, it's, it's a huge deal. What do we do to, to spread that? And you'll notice in the video, Will Gilmer is actually sharing this, and uh, he's spreading it on a hay field. Now, Haley, you talked a little bit about you guys raise hay too. What kind of, what, what do you raise as your hay? So since we just have heifers, we raise grass hay. And then any extra we have, we actually sell to um, people that usually raise horses and some cattle. Um, but yeah, we just have grass hay and then larger farms have alfalfa and usually make that into a haylage, which is more of a wet, um, wet hay. So if you were to go to if you were to go to a Farm and Fleet or Home Depot or wherever you purchase your seed supplies and you look for hay seeds, you aren't going to find them because you grow these you grow grass you grow alfalfa. Will Gilmer actually grows Bermuda grass in Alabama as a, a hay, but then they use the nutrients. Uh, the fertilizer as uh, water and poo, uh, they use that fertilizer uh, to help grow the hay, which then goes back to the cows. Do you kind of see that circle? I mean, it's, it's a Disney song, the circle of life, the doves fly and everything's good. Things go in a circle on a farm. So that's really, that's really important to see. Another link that we have uh, on the website, uh, beyondthebarndoor.wordpress.com, talks about methane digesters methane digesters and one of the things that happens um, with our water and poo is they can store this and convert the the gases from the uh the the, the extra water and poo and they can convert that into energy uh, i've got a link for a a family farm the blocks up in pearl city they're just west of freeport in stevenson county uh, they've been using digester since 2004 and this link that i provided for you actually shows how they uh how they are are powering their farm based off of a methane digester using using the using that so uh that's an important part of that um, next, another aspect that we want to talk about, and Chris talked about this a little bit during his, uh, during his session on Tuesday, but the idea of ultra high temperature, ultra high temperature UHT milk, which has an extended shelf life. Um, pretty exciting to stop and think. Uh, UHT milk, and you see it now, uh, Subway and Panera, they have UHT milk, those little milk jugs, uh, the little milk, uh, they look like juice boxes, um, that, that have an extended shelf life. Um, the interesting part about that is, is uh, this UHT technology has been around since the 1970s. And um, some of you who might have studied in college uh, a year or two before Haley did, back closer to when I did, if you went to the all night diner, and I know some of you said you don't drink coffee. I don't either. I drink tea. But also at those late night diners, they always had those little uh, creamers on the table made with real cream. And as a former waiter, I remember we put those out in the morning and we took them in at night. Well, how come that didn't go bad? Well, it was UHT milk. So we've been using UHT, ultra high temperature milk, that doesn't need to be refrigerated until it's opened since the 70s. So I did exclude, I did uh, include some links to, to that on there as well for you. Um, one interesting part about that, Chris also in his sessions mentioned uh, uh, tracking where your milk comes from. And if you haven't done it, it's, it's a lot of fun to stop and see, but where is my milk from.com and you can track and see where it's from. If you do go to Subway and buy a little uh, UHT milk, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the little uh, cartons of milk or that shelf stable milk, the, interestingly enough, the, the Subway milk all comes from a dairy farm in Phoenix, Arizona. In Phoenix, Arizona. It's uh, Shamrock Farms based out of Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, because the milk doesn't have to be refrigerated, it can come in with the, uh, it can come in with the, uh, 
with the uh, big old cans of black olives and the plastic wrappers. They can ship that around. And, uh, you know, uh, some people are like, Phoenix, Arizona, well, it's 110 there right now. Yeah, it is. But uh, in the winter, in the winter, it's, it's only 70. So it, it's funny, my sister actually lives out there. She talks about how horrible the Illinois winters are and how horrible the, the Arizona summers are. But they like, the, they like each uh, at other points in time. So just something to think about. Where does your milk come from and how does it, how does it get there? A um, couple of other activities, a couple of other things to stop and think about. Um, some information for your students. Uh, yesterday on our, on our blog site, uh, we continued with more dairy information. And yesterday was ice cream. And uh, Hannah Spangler, our, um, our, um, our, our back in the classroom intern, she had uh, done a, she did a video of her of her cousin that actually produces ice cream. Let's make an Illinois connection to that. Uh, Dippin' Dots, Dippin' Dots. Dippin' Dots are an Illinois ice cream. The guy who invented Dippin' Dots is originally from Illinois. He's originally from way down in Pulaski County, way down in sparse Southern Illinois, and he went to SIU. And uh, let's talk about Dippin' Dots and how those are made. Let's go to share screen. All right. So again, these are all on our um, these are all on the blog site that we're talking about. So I'll escape from this. So escape from this. Water and food. Water and food. Sorry. So we'll go to uh, Dippin' Dots, and we're gonna watch this uh, from the Food Network about Dippin' Dots and how those are made. <laughs> These machines are making lots and lots of dots. Dippin' Dots. 50,000 of them in each bag. What looks like stuff you sprinkle on top of a sundae is actually the real thing. Itty bitty beads of ice cream. It's ice cream frozen in little tiny spheres, little BBs of ice cream. The finished product definitely looks different, but Dippin' Dots start out the same as regular ice cream. Company officials shiver to think about sharing their top secret technique, but they do say the dots are frozen using liquid nitrogen to 320 degrees below zero. After the dinky dots are packaged, they're placed in cold storage that's about 50 below while they are quality control tested. Dippin' Dots have to be held much, much colder than conventional ice cream in order to keep their dot consistency. And therefore, we have to deal in a lot of ingredients that, uh, that are very, very cold. The finished dots are kept in a kind of underground ice cream layer surrounded by super cold CO2. But actually, the small round dot is one of the most efficient ways and one of the best ways to get a quick freeze on something. Because of their compact size, you can connect the dots to form any flavor. But good old chocolate is Dippin' Dots' most popular. Now, uh, stop sharing. So, um, so Dippin' Dots, actually, if you wanted to make those and you had access to liquid nitrogen, make up your own ice cream mix and then dump the liquid nitrogen in. It freezes, it takes the air out, and that's what you're left with. So the Dippin' Dots uh, company does have a, a secret way of doing that, but uh, you got to get the liquid nitrogen first. But that's a unique way of uh, talking, about, uh, talking about ice cream and where it's from. I know on our website and on our uh, blog site, we've been talking about making your own ice cream either in a Ziploc bag or with a coffee can. There are a number of ways to do that. And uh, so I think you all participated in the uh, poll. Thank you for doing that. And I'm sure that ice cream ranked as one of the highest ways. Uh, formed table, we talked a little bit about it in the video, uh, that idea of for the most part within about 48 hours, even though the, uh, the milk from some farms only travels to the processor every other day, once it gets to the processor, they are really, really expedient about getting it back out in the form of uh, various dairy products. Also on the, on the blog site, you'll find links to Midwest Dairy, and uh, uh, there are a couple great tours of making cream cheese, the Hulls Dairy Farm from Hancock County, and when their stuff goes to make cottage cheese. There's great activities about what goes on with cottage cheese and cream cheese and ice cream, and how it's all processed for you locally. Now for uh, teachers, June is Dairy Month, and we've done a lot of stuff on Dairy Month this year. Uh, given the supply chain issues, it makes sense for us to talk about that. 
but from a calendar perspective for your uh, for your students, all right, you're going to do apples in September and pumpkins in October and harvest in in uh, November and Thanksgiving and what we're thankful for those type of things. Um, I really want you to stop and think about uh, National Milk Day. National Milk Day on our website, we actually have a, a little place for this. National Milk Day is January 11th. And National Milk Day is the day that, uh, the first day in theory, it's not a Hallmark holiday, but they think that was the first day milk was actually delivered in glass bottles to consumers. And it goes all the way back to the 1800s. And I want you to stop and think about that. That's when we started becoming consumers. So everyone didn't have to have their own cow at home to milk. All of a sudden, farmers decided they could pool their resources and get milk to consumers, get milk uh, out to consumers there as well. Uh, uh, January 11th, and all that information is on our website. So we, we celebrated National Milk Day a couple of years ago, a couple of years in a row uh, with National Milk Day and information. and. Uh, I had some people say, well, you know, Kevin, there's a chance, there's a front moving through, we could get snow. And the most important part about that was, even if we did have snow and school was canceled and it was horrible outside, the cows still had to be milked. Uh, those cows have to be milked twice a day and there has to be care for those. So even if it's, uh, even if it's uh, cold outside for us as school or there's uh, icy road conditions or something like that, the cows still have to be milked. So I think that really goes back to that, uh, that idea of the importance of animal care and where it's from. As we finish up, I do want to talk about a couple of uh, uh, books that we've got uh, going for us, uh, some, some activities that, that go along with our materials. Um, and uh, these are all on the website as well. Again, we're talking, uh, we're promoting uh, Tales of the Dairy Godmother. Uh, we've got that aspect. We've got a couple of other ones. Um, to, to engage your students with, and these are listed on the website as well. Biomass, uh, biomass, uh, changing, a uh, fuel changing, biomass, biomass fueling change. That's the title of the book. And it really talks about that aspect of what are all the different biofuels, but it also includes a section on methane and methane digesters. And to keep those students interested, here's a great book too. It's a scholastic book, Onion Juice Poop, and other surprising sources of alternative energy. Other, other, other sources of alternative energy. Illinois authors, uh, we've got a couple Illinois authors that have done a lot with, uh, with um, um, uh, milk and uh, ice cream. Uh, Gail Gibbons does have the milk makers, but she also has one called uh, Ice Cream the Full Scoop. And again, Gail Gibbons is an Illinois author. Chris Peterson, we talk a lot about Chris Peterson. Um, I've got two books from Chris Peterson. The first one is Extra Cheese, Please. And Chris Peterson, she is a, an author from Wisconsin. She and her family, they run a, a Four Cubs Farm up in Grantsburg, Wisconsin. And uh, she writes books. And she wrote this book early in the, in the late 90s. And it's called Extra Cheese, Please. And it's Milk's Journey, a mozzarella's journey from cow to pizza. And she was just amazed at how few people understood where that came from. She updated that book later to Clarabelle the Cow. Again, talking about the importance of going from farm to the table for other, other people. Um, we've got another one here. Um, a cow, a bee, a cookie, and me. For our younger level students, a cow, a bee, a cookie, and me. Uh, this is a great book and it talks about uh, butter. You need butter to make the cookies and it, the, the recipe, you're pulling all the resources to see where it comes from to make cookies. For our upper level folks, for our upper level folks, um, Catherine Gilbert Murdoch uh, has a trilogy called The Dairy Queen. This is a junior high, senior high level material, upper junior high material, but The Dairy Queen, uh, there's a trilogy, Dairy Queen, Front and Center, and uh, The Off Season. Um, and, and Haley, I'm going to drop a copy of this in the mail to you because uh, it's about uh, teenage girls and working on dairy farms and how hard it really is. Uh, there's, a, there's this aspect of hard work that goes along with that. And another one, this is a good summertime read, it's called Stay Sweet by Siobhan Vivian. Um, and it's about a, a group of people who are working in a, uh, an ice cream parlor, uh, grouping people uh, uh, ice cream parlor. 
farmers. So a uh, couple good consumer questions in here. So what happens to, um, what happens to, what happens if you don't milk a cow for an extended period of time? Um, uh, what happens, Haley, if you don't milk a cow for an extended period of time? So not milking a cow means that they'll probably start leaking milk and then eventually they could damage their, um, the ligament or the part that holds up the udder. So if you have ever looked at a cow's udder, you see the crease in the middle and that helps support it, but that could actually cause a lot of damage to the ligament and cause a lot of damage to the cow. Right, and uh, that one, one common, uh, relatively common um, uh, ailment for dairy cows would be mastitis, correct? There's an infection in the udder. That would be uh, probably pretty typical. Uh, you've got a lot of cows and a lot of udders. Uh, so the importance of udder care. Um, we didn't actually see udder, we didn't actually see a milking process, but Haley, what, what do you know that goes on uh, uh, before milking? How are the udders and uh, uh, what happens to the cow to uh, make sure that that is protected and treated? So one of the things that gets done when they come into the parlor is they get um, wiped down to get all the debris off if they've been laying in the straw or the sawdust. Um, they do have a little bit of debris, so that gets wiped off. And then they get, um, I, uh, uh, some sort of a cleaner, different farms use different things to um, clean off and sanitize the teat and also to help get milk flowing. And then additionally, they also take a strip out of the milk manually. Um, and that's another way that they can check the milk for um, problems that could be going on, such as mastitis. After milking, they also get um, cleaned again to prevent bacteria from coming up into the teat cistern or the mammary system. There you go. Uh, antibiotic free. When a label says antibiotic free, does that mean it's never had antibiotics or that it's cleared? And Haley, I don't know if you know the answer to this. That's okay if you don't. Not necessarily that they've never had antibiotics. It means more of that it's cleared. Now, organic farms are not um, allowed to use antibiotics. So those are farms that don't use antibiotics at all. But just because it's labeled antibiotic free means that the milk has been cleared for the antibiotics and been tested along the way. And that's a really, that's a really good question because there's a lot of stuff that goes into the marketing of it. So uh, right now I'm antibiotic free, but a couple, couple months ago I had an ear infection. I wasn't then. So uh, I got healthy because of the antibiotic. It was fighting off a specific bacteria and my body wasn't able to do just like you would do with a cow. So, um, so all milk is antibiotic free. Uh, we've got some people talking about antibiotic free. Uh, so all milk is antibiotic free. Uh, at the time, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they haven't had an antibiotic in the past. So it's very much so, and it's, it's, it's like all natural. What does that mean? Those, those type of things. So we got some uh, discussions on that. There are great links if you want to learn more about that on Midwest Dairy, on the Midwest Dairy Association's website that goes along with that. So um, with that, um, with that, uh, I wanted to say one of the last questions. Uh, Haley, uh, uh, Future-wise, you're studying animal science uh, and you chose Iowa State to study animal science and dairy sciences. What does the future look like for you? What kind of career are you choosing to, to go down? So one of the things I'm looking into is doing more of a consulting position. So I have primarily worked with calves over the last few years and I'd love to help farmers to improve their calf care and improve their um, production the possibility of more production in the future. Right, and uh, one of the things that I think our teachers should note from this is uh, hopefully throughout the process, you've seen a number of career opportunities that are available to your students. Uh, it's more than the farmer. The farmer obviously plays an important part of this, but uh, they each our farmers, they talked about the vet care, they talked about the nutritionist, they talked about the seed salesman, they talked about uh, someone who's in charge of nutrient management, then you get into the processing and all the various roles of the processing. And uh, also, I think that was uh, interesting to see uh, the significant investment of the farmer, even in a four stall milking parlor, which is, it, it, that's a nice size parlor. He's able to work his cows through. He's working with 60 cows. So uh, milking, milking around 60 cows through 40. Think about that. There's, there's a time involvement in that, doing that twice a day, but also just the equipment 
the technology that goes into that, plus the technology that goes into testing and where those things are from. Um, so again, we'd like to thank uh, Haley. Our, our time is drawing to a close. We'd like to thank Haley for uh, uh, joining us and for putting together her, um, uh, her video. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, you've done a great job with that. For those of you who are on the chat, we would encourage you to fill out your, uh, your uh, evaluation uh, within the next, uh, <laughs> do it as quick as you can. As, as quick as we can get them in, we will get those, uh, we will get those, uh, uh, certificates processed and back to you. Those will only stay up for a week, so you have a chance to fill this out for just a week. With that, I'd really like to thank Haley. Uh, she had a, a quite an end of the summer, uh, quite the start of the summer, into the school year. She finished the school year. She got her internship. Everything was going virtual, but yet she still had to move back from Iowa to Indiana to Springfield. So for a little bit, Haley, we, we welcome you as, a, as an honorary Illinois citizen, and you did a great job. With that, everyone, thank you very much. We appreciate your time, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Next week, uh, we are talking about, uh, next week we're talking Tuesday, we're talking about STEM, STEM and STEM education. So we've got activities going on with STEM. And then next up, we're visiting a beef farm. We're visiting a beef farm. Um, uh, Mackenzie, our beef intern, will be uh, joining us. Uh, Haley will get to take the chance in the, uh, uh, she'll be out in the peanut gallery, be able to throw some questions to Haley about beef. But next uh, Thursday, we're about beef. Next Tuesday, we're about STEM. Also consider signing up and following the National Ag in the Classroom Conference as we honor teachers around the nation. And there's a chance for you to watch our Illinois Teacher of the Year, uh, Katie Buckley, on the National Ag in the Classroom Conference as she leads a presentation about STEM in her classroom. So uh, with that, thank you very much and you all have a great day. I'm gonna stop recording now. Haley, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Uh, no you problem. did a great